everybody. Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Denison. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. Today, it's Star Wars The Force Awakens Day. Woo! Woo! Open last night. I'm sure tons of you have already seen it, and I'm sure tons of you are going to watch it today and over the weekend. Just to let you guys a reminder, we already have our non-spoilers review up on our YouTube channel, but we have our spoilers review, the one that after you've already seen the movie, is coming out later today, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, check that out when you get a chance. I also hear David Griffin. I am going off no sleep, people. <laughs> I have seen, I saw Force Awakens at 2.30 in the morning last night. Went to breakfast afterwards. I'm still awake. It's all in my head right now. I can't think of anything else but Star Wars right now. I'm happy to be here excited to talk about Star Wars Day. Also here, Clark Wolf. <laughs> hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I also saw Star Wars last night, but not at 2.30. Saw it at 10.30, so I got a little sleep. Smart. And I'm a happy camper. <laughs> well, speaking of Star Wars, last night the highly anticipated Star Wars The Force Awakens opened and again has broken another box office record. It's being estimated that the movie made between 50 to 55 million in its Thursday night showings, beating the previous record holder, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 2, which took in 43.5 million back in July of 2011. Industry analysts predict the movie will open to 210 million or more for the entire weekend. Dennis, what do you make of Star Wars The Force Awakens big opening night? And do you think it will break the opening weekend record of 208.8 million set earlier this year by Jurassic World? Uh, it's actually not really a big surprise. Actually, it would have been a bigger surprise if it didn't break the record for a few things. One, I mean, Star Wars is Star Wars. There's nothing else like it. I mean, Harry Potter is big, but Star Wars is much bigger. Two, back when uh, Harry Potter debuted, they still had did only those midnight screens, where it's actually they couldn't show it until midnight. Now we have the... I think it started at 7 o'clock mm -hmm. last night. There was 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 7.30, all through the night. So not a big surprise. Do I think it's going to break the Jurassic World one? I do, but I'm not like 100% sure just because, you know, I, I, I think it's going to make more money overall mm -hmm. for sure. But the weekend, I, I, I have a feeling that people may be a little scared in terms of like that, that didn't pre-order their tickets like we did they may be like oh maybe i'll wait till next week mm -hmm. i don't want to show up and then have to wait in a huge long line but i do think word of mouth is good i think the movie delivers i mean there is a small minority of people who don't like the film but it's not anything like controversial where it's like half the people love it half the people hate it. i'd say like 80 to 90 percent of the people that i've talked to and online critics everything they all like it word of mouth so i do think so i will give a prediction of Oh, I, I totally didn't think it was going to break the record now after this crazy, crazy week. I don't know, 235. 235. Wow. Uh, Clark, huge. What, what do you think? Big, what, that's a big yeah. number. <laughs> what do you think? Um, well, I do agree with you. I think it's going to break the record. And uh, I think it, it might have been the last time I was on Movie Talk. I'm not sure. But uh, Mark Ellis and I said, yes, it'll break it. Harloff said no. I think Ellis and I are going to be right. Um, and uh, But, you know, I think you're right, Dennis. The, the thing that might be weird or throw a little wrench in it is the idea that everybody already got tickets. So there are no more tickets to be had. And you can't see it this weekend, so you better just wait. And that would be unfortunate because I do, I was saying you guys off mic before we started rolling, I want Jurassic World to be the lar being the largest opening weekend ever to be erased from history. <laughs> it should have never happened. It should have never gone that way. And but also The Force Awakens is, it's a great film. And also, I think with Force Awakens, you're going to have people who are going to see it three, four yeah. times. So you're going to have people going back as much as they mm -hmm. possibly can. So hopefully that will, that will you know, boost those numbers for the people who might be hesitant. Um, in terms of a prediction, I'm going to say like $11 billion. <laughs> 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 $11 billion is my guess. And I'm probably going to be right come Monday yes. morning. David? I'm going to go a little under $11 billion, <laughs> even though $11 billion I think is pretty close. <laughs> I'm going to shoot around 225 million. I think it's going to do huge enough. I feel like we're doing the prices right now. Like $1 yeah. Bob, you know, but uh, <laughs> it was, it, it was, it's, it's such a great movie. I know you guys are going to watch the uh, probably non-spoiler review and hopefully the spoiler review later. It's fantastic. It's a lot of fun, but I think that people don't realize that 
theaters are adding show times even now. They're still adding more show times. I mean, they were cranking the, the the people in the theater last night. I mean, there was hardly any you know rest between uh, one show to the next show. So I think they're going to get as many showings as they can. I think it's going to surprise people how much it's going to make. I've never heard of a five a.m. showing of a movie. Yeah, yeah. And they're sold out. John, yeah, I didn't know we're back there. Went they're to the five a.m. showing. Yeah, I, that's crazy to me. Yeah, and you went to the what two a.m. I went to the two a.m. showing. Sure, and people were rowdy. It was sold out. I mean, it was great. As soon as it's almost like going to like a Space Mountain over at Disney. As soon as like the doors open. <laughs> And everybody started cheering. Yeah. We're all outside waiting in the cold for two hours. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. I, I went to see it for a second time. Uh, Wendy went with me. John Campia. John <clears throat> Schnapp. Uh, like, and just, I think, being around that crowd. Because we'd already seen it. But this was the first time seeing it with like the general audience. It was so mm -hmm. much fun. Because there were so many people out there cheering and yelling. Screaming. And, of course, Disney's smart. They, they opened up a merchandise like pop-up stand in the theater mm -hmm. so people would buy stuff I, I i have a feeling though most people didn't buy stuff until after they saw the movie because they mm -hmm. were like just in case it's the like the prequels <laughs> right. or something like that like and then after they like they they saw it and they were relieved like, All right, i'm gonna buy my merchandise now <laughs> um are you guys planning on seeing it again i am i, I need to because we were talking about this before i feel like I saw it half with my fanboy eyes and half with my critics' eyes, as you know, sizing up the movie compared to the rest of the action and other films that came out this year. So I need to see it again, just kind of relax and just enjoy it as a fan. I think that's right. And with the anticipation that goes into all of this, if you are a fan, you have expectations, yes. you have predictions, mm -hmm. you've been reading theories. It could be very challenging to actually watch the movie that is in front of you mm -hmm. with all of those things going on in your head. But I have to say, for me, you know, the first. The, um, this I had been very spoiler free, mm -hmm. and um, and I really enjoyed the film. And when it ended, I turned, I was like, oh! and I turned to my friend, and I was like, "That's it! Wait a second! <laughs> <laughs> it was just like this, um, without giving a spoiler." But I just was like, "Oh my god!" And um, and so I'm absolutely even more excited for the second movie. And I think that that's something to remember. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a huge Star Wars fan, and he got to go to the premiere. And I and you know I was like, "So what did you think?" And he was like, "It's great. I mm -hmm. really like it. Is it?" Dark Knight level awesome, mm -hmm. maybe no, not. No. And but I think that that's a really good analogy because mm -hmm. if we think about Star Wars as compared to like Batman, for instance, you know, so you have a couple of great films that everybody loves, mm -hmm. and then you have some movies that maybe left a bad taste mm -hmm. in your mouth, and everybody goes, no, 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 wait a minute. And so you have to have something that essentially sets everything back on track sets everything up so that the second film that can soar. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's exactly what's going to happen with the Star Wars franchise. That's what J.J. does so well. He did it with Star Trek. He mm -hmm. did it with, you know, Star Wars. I mean, he, he just rewrites the ship. The ship needs to get back on track, like you said, Clark. And that's what he does well. That's why they hired J.J. to do the first movie. And, and by doing this movie, he had to cover a lot of ground. There's 30 years of history that they have to kind of, a lot of exposition in the movie. But he kind of has set up set it up for Ryan Johnson just like throwing it here's the softball I've you know I've done all, a lot of work for you so now you can just hit it out of the ballpark like a Dark Knight or, or Empire Strikes Back yeah this is this is not going to be my favorite movie of the year but it might have been my favorite movie going experience of totally. the year you know it was just so much fun but but yeah I think once you shed a lot of the expectations and the hype and and, and then maybe when you guys you see it a second time you saw it uh just my first Just time first last time. night, okay. yeah, so I'm going to probably go again soon. All the people I saw it with, it was like their second time, and I think they enjoyed it more because they could release all of those things and just watch it. I actually want to see it again let's say this weekend but i may not just because i am afraid that mm -hmm. there's just going to be so many people and so maybe i'll wait till till next week mm -hmm. all right uh what's next since it's released on monday the first teaser trailer for star trek beyond the third installment of the rebooted franchise has been met with a fair share of criticism especially from star trek fans in an interview at the european premiere of star wars the force awakens simon pegg who is one of the people behind the star trek beyond script and one of its lead actors was asked Asked about his thoughts on the first trailer in which he responded it was very action-packed it was surprising I kind of find it to be the marketing people sort of saying everybody come and see this film it's full of action and fun when there's a lot more to it than that Clark what do you think of Simon Pegg's comments on the Star Trek Beyond trailer I think he's right I mean I think it's an issue of the way they've chosen to market this film and I think also you know um, 
I think studios, especially when it comes to big franchises, are looking at what seems to be working. When I was talking to somebody uh, about this trailer before I had had a chance to watch it, they said, it's Guardians of the Galaxy. It's basically what they were saying is it's in space and it has a rock song to it <laughs> and uh, people are making quippy lines mm -hmm. and like, and, and I was like, okay, and I saw it last night before um, Star Wars and I kind of was like, yeah, I could see that. But I think that this is where uh, studios get bad blood from their fans and from their mm. audiences by trying to sell movies and properties as things that they're not and also by ch trying to change the origin or trying to change the um, true meat of the story mm. into something that it's not. It's like fitting a square peg into a round hole. Mm. You can't do it. You shouldn't do it. But I think that, you know, and admittedly I'm not a Trekkie, but I know enough to know that the last film was not entirely popular with Trekkies. Yeah. And I think that, you know, for people who are Trekkies, this movie probably makes them very nervous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my own personal opinion, one of the things that people like so much about Star Trek, just the overall franchise, is that it has social commentary, that it's thoughtful, that it's, you know, it's heart more, a little heartfelt. And um, I would actually like to see that from a Star <laughs> Trek movie, but I don't think that that's what the studio is necessarily wanting to do. And so um, I think this is a big we'll see. Yeah, and then another thing we have to remember too is they weren't delivering on what you're talking about, even things to the core nature of Star Trek right. in their latest few movies that they did have. They were there. I think that what they were trying to do is ride that line. They were like, "Well, we need to make it more popular and, and mainstream for the casual audience, and then we're going to still stick with the Star Trek roots." And it kind of like fell in between, and, and it didn't satisfy anyone. And now they've gone full ways to the mainstream. Okay, we just want an entertaining film. And you know what? The box office numbers don't lie. That's what's what's working for them. Um, I think Simon Pegg is holding back his thoughts about the trailer. Mm -hmm. I think he he wants to say more, but he's like being more reserved because he is the screenwriter of it. He's one of the main actors of it. I personally didn't care for the trailer, uh, and this is coming from someone who actually enjoyed the the, the two J.J. Abrams mm -hmm. one. So it's not a hate thing. I'm not going coming from a. I I, I like the the original the Star Trek the Next Generation. I like the Star Trek franchise, and I understand that this is not attuned to that. But I still enjoy them. Uh, I think the movie is what he says. It's there's more to it than what they just showed us, uh, David. I, I'm always pulled in two different directions with the Star Trek franchise. I'm never sure where to go. I, I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s watching The Next Generation with my dad. I, I miss the, Clark, like you were saying, the social commentary. I, I miss the movies. I, I miss the voyage home, you know, like, Captain, there be whales here. You know, I miss the, the humpback whales. I miss uh, the undiscovered country with the Shakespeare. And it is slow. It is a little more deliberate, and especially with what's going on in our society right now. You can put social commentary. Look at look what uh, look at District Nine. Mm -hmm. Talk about social commentary. That movie made a good amount of money for the budget that it had, and it sh showed something about you know like apartheid in South Africa, but changed it and put put aliens instead of white versus black. You can do those things and make money. It's just that I think the students need to find more creative ways to do that. I don't want to judge the film because we haven't seen it yet. I have no idea what it's going to be. They could have maybe they have some of those themes in there with the whole uh, exploration of the frontier and messing with uh, societies that maybe they shouldn't mess with. So maybe we'll see that. But um, I agree with Simon. I think this was a bad trailer. I hope the next trailer is better. I don't, we were watching Star Wars last night. The trailer came on. That was probably the quietest reaction of all the trailers they showed. People were more amped for Batman v Superman and other movies that they showed besides that one. Well, to, to counteract your point, though, uh, the studios and the filmmakers need to do what you're talking about well. You're talking about District 9. Let's flip it on the <coughs> other side. Neil Blomkamp and Elysium. That was not done well. No. Like, he tried to yeah. make so, too much social right. commentary right. Right. and then it ended up being kind of... It's, not easy. Know, it's not easy. Yeah. So, so you have to do it well and entertain people. Right. Well, and also, I think, like, um, an example for me, I'm a horror fan, and it, these movies haven't come out yet, but one of the big controversies in the Universal uh, Monster reboots happened happened about a year ago. Donna Langley, who is sort of in charge, she's the chairman of Universal, um, said we're taking the horror out of our monsters and we're <laughs> gonna make them like superheroes because we don't have superheroes. Mm -hmm. And horror fans were just like, what? No, what are you talking about? And so, um, you know, they've they've really done their. We haven't seen the first Mummy movie, which is supposed to come out in I think 2017. Um, but uh, you know, the point I'm making is that. It scares me as a fan when studios take their properties and go, well, we have fans of these, and this is why fans like them, but we don't really care about that. We're just gonna kinda try and make it all mm -hmm. into 
into Avengers. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but that's not what the Wolfman is. The Wolfman <laughs> isn't an Avenger. And, and, <laughs> He's not a team. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna form the about? mummy and the Wolfman. <laughs> Frankenstein. Yeah. They're gonna like have this like circling shot around yeah, them it's just like, <laughs> in wait, the like, middle of New York City. Yeah. This is not the same. You know. So my point is with Star Trek. You know, it's unfortunate for that. That you know. And, and I'm with you, Dennis. I'm I'm probably one of the only people that enjoyed Into Darkness as much as I did. But the point is, you know, it's like these are the fans. You you can't you you should really try and stay as true mm -hmm. to to as much of the source material as you can mm -hmm. and honor that source material. All right, uh, on to buy or sell. Uh, Ashley, what do we got? A new image and character posters for the upcoming Ghostbusters movie have come out. The image features all four cast members, Kristen Wiig, Melissa McCarthy, Kate McKinnon, and Leslie Jones in their Ghostbusters outfits and gear. There are also individual posters for each of the four characters and the following character info has come out. Kristen Wiig plays Aaron Gilbert, a particle physicist, academic firebrand, and spectral warrior. Kate McKinnon is Jillian Holtzman, a nuclear engineer, munitions expert, and proton wrangler. <laughs> Melissa McCarthy is Abby Yates, a paranormal researcher, supernatural scientist, and entity trapper. And Leslie Jones is Patty Tolan, a ghost tracker, municipal historian, and metaphysical commando. Ghostbusters is being directed by Paul Feig and is set for release in theaters on July 15, 2016. David, buy or sell these images and character descriptions. I, I, I buy, I, I'll say I buy or sell all of it. Uh, I, I, I buy all of it. I really love the look of everything. I love, uh, especially Leslie Jones and Metaphysical Commando. I mean, she looks like a commando. She looks great. And pl plus, because it's Paul Feig behind all this. You know, we talk about, you know, uh, Joss Whedon, you know, uh, does great work with uh, a strong female characters. But, I mean, Paul Feig, you know, a spy and uh, Bridesmaids is fantastic at that. He's maybe one of the best in Hollywood right now. Um, so I'm excited to see these women in action. I think they're going to do a great job. The posters look great. I mean, it just it looks it's fantastic. It's Ghostbusters. It doesn't matter. You know, it's great that we're getting an all-female cast. And it's Ghostbusters. I want to be back in that world again. Clark? Oh, yeah. I'm right with you. I'm so excited for this movie. I love... I was just watching an old episode of Arrested Development yesterday. It's one of my favorites. And, uh, of course, Paul Feig directed it. And I was like, of course he did. Mm -hmm. um, I think he is a great, great, great comedic director. But also, I think that he has a dark edge to him. And that's what I like so much about his comedy. If you think about a movie like The Heat with Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy, which gets better for me every time I watch it. I like that movie. I like it a lot. And um, But that is a dark film. There, It is violent. Um, it is gnarly. It is nasty. But it is funny as hell. And I think that he, these women, he... I think is going to be able to direct them very well. And I have to say, I'm a, still a fan of Saturday Night Live, and the two biggest breakout stars on Saturday Night Live right now are in this movie, and that is Leslie Jones and Kate McKinnon. Both of them are incredible comedic talents, but they're so different in mm -hmm. what they do. Um, and of course, I love Kristen Wiig and uh, Melissa McCarthy, and both of them have already worked with Paul Feig. So I think that this is great. And like you said, David, you know, this is Ghostbusters. It looks like Ghostbusters. <laughs> like, and you know I um I don't care for if the people whoever says I'm not gonna go see it because yeah. we're g cool bye bye I don't it's still care. gonna make a ton of money it's gonna make a ton of money because it's gonna be a great movie it's I, I I mean we haven't seen it yet we haven't seen a trailer yet fine but I'm gonna go ahead and say that I think it's going to be a successful film both you know in terms of fan reaction and in terms of box office yeah and you're looking at the people behind it I mean yeah obviously we can't say if it it we we think it's gonna be a good movie I mean speaking of Paul Feig like. Man, think about all the people that came from Freaks and Geeks. Oh, yeah. Paul Feig, Judd Apatow, and then you have all like James Franco, Seth, Seth Rogen, Rogen, Jason Segel, Martin Starr, Martin Starr, um, uh, Linda Cardellini, who's made a resurgence lately on mm -hmm. on the big screen. Uh, yeah, I, I buy all these uh, pictures and posters and descriptions. The posters look great. Uh, those character posters, because I, I I always think of if I'm in, at a movie theater and I'm walking down the hallway. And I see a poster. Am I going to stop and look at it? And I, when I look at these, yes, I would. I would look at. Them, I like the black and white contrast. It's really contrasty with a little bit of color to them. Uh, and yeah, those descriptions crack me up. <laughs> what is it? Metaphysical commando, entity trapper, proton wrangler, proton wrangler spectral is warrior. <laughs> it's it's a it's, historian. It's, 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 it's hilarious. And by the way, you know, keep in mind too, there was all this 
flack about, you know, like allegedly the thing that was holding up um, a reboot or another Ghostbusters film uh, with the original cast um, in the first place was Bill Murray. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Murray was one of the first cameos that was confirmed for this movie. And I think, and he has said as much, he has said, these women are all incredibly funny and that's why I wanted to do this movie. Mm -hmm. So I feel like they're, if you if if Bill Murray's seal of approval isn't enough for you, and when it comes to Ghostbusters, mm. then sorry. Ashley, are, are you looking forward to this new Ghostbusters I movie? I am super excited. Not only is it exciting to see kind of a new Ghostbusters, but Bridesmaids is one of my favorite movies of all time. So when you have Paul Feig and Kristen Wiig, who is like my idol of <laughs> life. Uh, yes, yes, I'm super excited to see this movie. Super excited. All right, cool. What's next? The Prometheus sequel, now known as Alien Covenant, has landed its female lead. According to the rap, actress Katherine Watterson has been cast to star opposite Michael Fassbender in the upcoming Ridley Scott directed sci fi flick. Alien Covenant is set for an October 6, 2017 release date. Dennis Byer saw the casting of Watterson in Alien Covenant. I buy it. I, I like her. I've seen her. I haven't seen her in too much stuff, but I liked her in Inherent. Vice, and I liked her in um, Steve Jobs, See Steve Jobs yeah. uh, which you know is not really getting too much buzz. I actually really like that movie. Um, she's in that upcoming, what is it, Fantastic Beasts mm -hmm. and, and Where to Find the, the, the Harry Potter spinoff prequel thing. It looks like though, whatever character she's playing in this movie is going to be a lot different than than those type of movies. I I mean. Hopefully it's a, a Ripley type character, maybe not a rip off of it, but something like that strong lead, lead female, which by the way, we're getting a lot this year. We've got Furiosa from Mad Max Fury Road. We have Ray, which we just saw in Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and then uh, Rebecca Ferguson in Mission Impossible so Rogue good. Nation. So I, I'm all for this. I, I, I can't wait to see like a trailer or something for this, Clark. Yeah, um, I'm not as familiar with her as an actress just because I'm, I haven't seen Steve Jobs yet. Um, but uh, I, I buy it, you know, because I, I actually liked Prometheus. So did I. I, I so did I. Yeah, you're not alone. Yeah, yeah. So like, I know that this is. This is rare. We have three people yeah. who yeah. actually like <laughs> Prometheus on the panel. Will I say that it's the greatest no. film ever made? No, of course not. Will I say that I enjoyed it? Yeah, I will. And yes, I've seen it more than once, and I still enjoy it. So, um, I'm excited, and I think Ridley Scott has just come off the Martian, uh, of probably a good success, probably a little confident, and I think that that's cool. And so I'm excited for the return to this world, and um, even if it is a second Prometheus. Mm -hmm. film I think that that's great and I'm curious and I want to know more about this world so I buy it David yeah I'm curious I mean I buy it I I, I like the Watersons gonna be in it but I'm also curious to see where's Numi you know yeah. that's the question I mean we there's still no confirmation about where she is I mean we know that if you read the description the synopsis it says that Michael Fassbender David his character David is on a planet that they assume is a paradise but he is the only inhabitant there no one's with him so has it been a long time because he's an android so I'm sure he can last longer than Numi Rapace can are they gonna write her off is she somewhere else but I'm glad that really Scott keeps casting women Sigourney Weaver, you know, made her career the Alien franchise, you know, now uh, Watterson too. I mean, I'm glad that he keeps doing that. Numi Rapace was fantastic in Prometheus, so it's great to see that he's still following that formula. I wonder if she will break out. I mean, she's an up and coming rising, mm -hmm. you know, actress, but she hasn't hit that level. Maybe whether it's a Fantastic Beast right. or maybe it's this movie that's going to break her out. We'll, maybe we'll, she'll be like the next Alicia Vikander who's kind of blowing up right now. Yeah, you know? yeah we'll see. All right, uh, what's next? <laughs> Only a month after its first trailer, Lionsgate has released another new trailer for Gods of Egypt. The first was directed by Alex Proyas and stars Gerard Butler, Nikolai Coster-Waldo, Jeffrey Rush, Brenton Thwaites, Elodie Young, Abby Lee, Chadwick Boseman, and Courtney Eaton. Gods of Egypt opens in theaters everywhere on February 26, 2016. Clark Byers saw this new trailer for Gods of Egypt. I mean, I... Uh, I don't buy it, I don't sell it. Like, and I just leave it on the table. <laughs> I, this, okay, so this is the thing, with the Gods of, the Gods of Egypt trailer, the first one that came out, I watched it and I was like, purely, forget about the white wa mm. whitewashing of mm -hmm. the cast, okay? Let's just put that aside for one second. I watched the trailer and I was like, okay. I mean, like, it, I didn't hate it, I didn't love it, I was just like, well, this, I'm not gonna go see this, but or whatever. And um, and so with this new trailer, you know, I get the course correction, it feels like course correction, it feels like, whoops, like, we, we messed up and we should try and spin this a different way. But, you know, at the end of the day, my question, we were talking about this off mic, I don't understand why Lionscape made this movie. Why did they make this? Why did they say, oh, you know what? 
people are going to turn out to see is this crazy weird movie with, I mean, like, it just seems so um, strange. It seems like a really strange film in general. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like it has a timely predecessor. It doesn't seem like it's on trend right now. So it's just, I, this is just such a big head scratcher to me. And then of course, the whitewashing of the cast, which is never okay, Hollywood, <laughs> if you're watching when you're making movies that are set in Egypt, you should, pro you know, I mean, whatever. So I, I, can I pass? <laughs> can I buy it and sell it? Do you want to be the tiebreaker? Well, I, well, I'm going to sell it. And it's not because I think it's a horrible trailer. I just think I preferred kind of the silly over the top, maybe fun thing about the first trailer. Like, it is a movie I am going to check out. I am a fan of Alex Proyas. I like Dark City. I like The Crow. I even didn't mind iRobot. Um, I like iRobot. Like so... This one actually had a lot of cool visuals to it that they didn't show in the first trailer. Yeah, I you know I am wondering why they made this movie. It's not like Clash of the Titans and its sequel because that's what kind of this the feel right. of this really you know hit it big at the box office. So I'm not quite sure why. And then even Exodus, you know, you had all whitewashing of of <laughs> Egyptians there. Didn't do, even with the big names like Christian Bale, uh, like didn't do very well and uh, a big name like ridley scott yeah hello i'm yeah. A, I, yeah and it's I, not good when the studio sends out an apology after the first you're like well what had happened was <laughs> you know what had happened was my bad you know it's just yeah i just this doesn't look good i'm i'm selling it I'll, I'll take yours and i'll sell both of ours okay, we'll make a little profit off it am i the one on the table that's still actually gonna watch it though i mean if somebody puts it on in front of me i'm not gonna get out of the walk out of the room dennis you take me to go see it I'll see it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I agree. I'll go we'll, see it with Dennis. We'll go on each arm. Okay. Yeah. On we'll, each enjoy, arm. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll enjoy Have a good time. We'll go celebrate diversity. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So now on to our next segment, which is brought to us by our friends at AMC Theaters. We make our box office predictions. This is where we guess what's going to top the box office, the top five this weekend. Surprise, surprise. I wonder what number <laughs> one is going to be. Clark, why don't you start us off? Here? All right. Because I'm so good at this, yes. as all the viewers uh, know every time I come on Friday and mess this up. Um, so, number one, I have Star Wars. No? Really? So, are we really? on the what? same page? Are we all in agreement? I don't know. Um, uh, for number two, I have sisters, Amy Poehler and Tina Fey. Um, let's not forget them, Dream Team. I, although, th this is such a curious time to put this movie out. Yes. I understand the idea of, okay, well, you know, all the quote unquote fanboys are going to be seeing Star Wars, so we'll give the girls something, which is just really backwards thinking to me, and I don't appreciate yeah. it. But that being said, um, you know, I love Amy and Tina, and so they're number two. Um, although, have you guys been hearing anything about Sisters? Uh, I know Christian didn't care for it, okay. but he also said that when he saw it, a lot of people were laughing, and mm. and I don't know what the uh, Rotten Tomatoes score is, but he said it wasn't wasn't that bad. So. I just haven't been hearing anything about it. Uh, maybe that's because Star, Star Wars, Wars is yeah, sucking yeah, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right. But but yeah, okay. So number three, I have um, Hunger Games as a holdover. Mm -hmm. um, number four, I have Alvin and the Chipmunks. And number five is Creed, because why not? Okay. Because I'm bad at this game. So, <laughs> yeah. You're not believing in the Alvin Simon uh, and the Chipmunks. Yeah, obviously, number one, Star Wars The Force Awakens. I have uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Road Chip uh, is number two, which apparently I've never seen any of these movies. The trailers make me like want to vomit. That's how bad the trailers are. <laughs> um, but someone had written in the comments that it's not just the third movie. It's the fourth movie? That's crazy. Chipwrecked, the original... The road chip. What's the fourth? I don't. I don't. Like, I like how they put chip in front of everything. Well, they kind of just like tweak a little bit. I mean, okay. you get it? It's like boom. How <laughs> will you know it's an Alvin and the Chipmunks movie? Yeah, I, I have a feeling like you know, peop, uh, parents aren't gonna have. They can't bring their kids to go see Star Wars. I mean, if they're young, because mm -hmm. it, it's pretty violent. Even though it's you know, yeah. I think it's PG thirteen. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, I have Sisters. Number four, I have The Good Dinosaur. Kind of for the same reasons. Alvin and the Chipmunks are going to do well. Got to bring some kids in there. Though that was a little more violent than I expected. I don't know if you guys Good saw. Dinosaur? Yeah. I seen it yet. Yeah, it had, there's some, yeah, there's some tough moments in yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and number five, I'll put Hunger Games Mocking Jay Part Two. I just feel like it's, you know, it's a juggernaut. It's going to keep trekking on. I mean, I, 
I want Creed to be up in the top five, but I just I think it's gonna fall so good. Fall, fall out. Uh, David, uh, similar to yours, and us close uh, doing Star Wars: Force Awakens at number one, sold in my two hundred twenty-five million. <laughs> I hope uh, I, I have some faith in Alvin. Alvin, you know Alvin Simon <laughs> Theod. All right, I'm gonna sing on here. Everybody's like, "Wow, stop doing that, David." Uh, Alvin the Chipmunks at number two. Uh, Sisters at number three. Um, four. I'm gonna still go with the Hunger Games. I think okay. that's still gonna do well, a little bit better than uh, the Good Dinosaur at number five. Okay. All right, guys, uh, that's it for box office predictions. Now on to Mailbag. Just want to remind you, after Mailbag, we're going to take your live Twitter questions. You can tweet at us, at Collider Video, uh, and just send your questions. Actually, we'll pick them out. But let's get on to our Mailbag, where you can email us at uh, CollidorVideo at gmail.com. We take your questions here. And on the weekend, John takes them on Mailbag as well. Ashley, what do we got? Daxamundo writes, hi, all. Love movie talk. Heroes and Collider Jedi Council. Great stuff. John has talked about the concept of MacGuffin in the past, which is new to me since I know almost nothing about the structure of a film. Would you please give some examples of the MacGuffin in films, if you can provide examples from past Star Wars films and or movies based on comics, X-Men, Men of Steel, etc.? That would be great. Thanks. Uh, the MacGuffin, it's, it's, it's a plot device that's used through movies. It's not really a plot structure or anything like that. It's just something that it's like either a desired object or goal for one of the main characters that kind of drives the story and actually doesn't really have much it's more a kind of a surface level thing to drive the plot versus the character like a good example would be uh the briefcase in pulp fiction mm -hmm. that uh vincent vega john travolta and uh Jewel Sam Jackson are after you don't know anything about that briefcase at all like it's just but for some reason Marcellus want, Wallace wants it and they have to go uh, uh, retrieve it um, some people would consider uh, the Death Star plans in the New Hope mm -hmm. uh, a, a yep. MacGuffin as well because it really doesn't have that much to do with the character of Luke Skywalker it just helps set everything up and put everything in in motion the Maltese Falcon. Uh, do you have any others? Yeah, um, a lot of people think the Ark in Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark mm -hmm. is is a MacGuffin, um, and uh, the OG, aside from the Maltese Falcon, is Rosebud yeah. in Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't really ultimately matter what Rosebud is, but it is the thing that sets the story in motion, and and you get the film. Um, out of all of that. And sometimes people are MacGuffins. So like in The Hangover, Doug is a MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. They have to go find Doug, but really at the end of the day, Doug doesn't <laughs> really like do much or yes, matter. Yes, and not, not much screen time for exactly, him. Exactly, exactly. So those are a couple of like recent examples. Uh, you know, Lord of the Rings, uh, the One the Ring. Ring. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a big book. It's in the title. Um, uh, also, though, he was asking about Man of Steel. I was thinking about that for a while. Man of Steel is interesting because it's not really an object. I think he's he's just looking for identity. I would say his search of who he is as a person. You know, finding you know the hologram of his father Jarrell talking to him, finding out who he is, his his goal in life, his purpose, what he's supposed to be. Oh, I would yeah. say is the MacGuffin. Because I guess like so how does that relate to Man of Steel? I was trying to think it's not really. Uh, you know what could be yeah. is the that codex thing. The thing that oh, like yeah. that that, yeah. that, that yeah. gets put into his body that's, right. that's kind of a yeah. MacGuffin. Totally. Yeah, that's true. Not not a hundred percent like one of the ones we mentioned. There doesn't right. have to be a MacGuffin in each film, no. by the no. way. Like right. to answer your question, that's not a requirement of a screenplay. It mm. is a device that's used often in screenwriting, but it's not. You don't have to have one. It's not like an act, a three act structure or right. something like no, that. No, no, and even a three act structure doesn't have exactly. to be followed as well. Exactly. So, all right, what's next? Amo Rayo writes, with all the major award nominations coming out and the year almost at an end, I was wondering what you guys think will be the biggest surprise nomination at the Oscars. I think Jake Gyllenhaal for Southpaw could get a Best Actor nod, yet highly unlikely, and any nod for The Gift even more unlikely. Thanks. David, what are some things that you think would come up that might surprise us during Oscar Because there are a couple. One, uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, Alicia Vikander, who's up for two Golden Globes right now. The obvious choice for the Oscar nomination is Danish Girl because mm -hmm. it looks like an Oscar film. I don't think it was that great, though. I watched it the other day. It was okay. Her performance was excellent. The movie was okay. Ex Machina, though, is what I want to see her nominated for. I would love to see her have a Best Supporting Actress nomination for uh, Ex Machina. Also, good love for my brothers and sisters out there. I want to see Straight Outta Compton for Best Picture mm -hmm. and also Dope. <laughs> For best picture, no, dope, was, dope was fantastic. It's one of my top ten films of the year. I'm telling everybody to see it. I love dope. It was the one of the few coming of age stories that focused on inner city African Americans. I love coming of age stories. Super bad, dazed and confused. But there's very few that focus solely on African Americans. You know, uh, men and women. And I love that we actually got to see that in dope. So dope and straight out of Compton for best picture. Um, I would love to see Fury Road 
get mm-hmm. nominated for Best Picture because it is one of the best movies of the year. Mm-hmm. I would love to see um, Charlize Theron nominated for Fur- her portrayal of Furiosa. Uh, when it comes to Straight Outta Compton, I would like to see F. Gary Gray get a nomination. I think he directed the hell out of that movie. Mm-hmm. And even if the movie, I loved the film. I thought it was incredibly entertaining. Um, and and so, but I think he is the thing that sort of made it entertaining. Mm-hmm. And those the actors are all great too. But if I had to pick one for Straight Outta Compton, that would be it. But you know, I was thinking about this too. And aside from really wanting something like Mad Max to get the credit that it deserves, because I do think it deserves those things. I don't know. The Oscars have been playing it so safe the yeah. last couple of years. Um, mm. To your question about uh, Southpaw and Jake Gyllenhaal, I got bad news. If Jake Gyllenhaal didn't get a nomination for Nightcrawler, He's not going to get one for Southpaw. And if you haven't seen Nightcrawler, if you're a fan of Jake Gyllenhaal, probably, I think, his best performance that I've ever seen. Um, And then, you know, last year I was upset that Essie Davis for The Babadook didn't get an acting nomination, but apparently there was a problem with, like, submitting her. But Mm -hmm. I thought that was one of the best performances of the year. So, you know, the Oscars have been pretty safe lately. And um, But I think what's interesting... You bring up Ex Machina, stuff like uh, Straight Outta Compton, stuff like Fury Road. What's cool is that stuff in the genre that's outside of traditional Mm -hmm. um, quote unquote awards movies are actually some of the best reviewed films of the year. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really encouraging. And I think that if the Oscars wanted to do something to try and get a younger demographic Mm -hmm. interested, which is why they're doing all this weird host stunt casting like Anne Hathaway and James Franco Mm -hmm. or something like Seth MacFarlane, you know, don't get a young, goofy host. Start nominating movies that people (laughs) see. and that people like and that are good so that's my little rant because I hate the Oscars because I can't identify with them I can't relate to them what's up because I mean Danish Girl we live in LA I had to go to a small theater in Pasadena to find Danish Girl I mean you gotta gotta search for those movies I mean they're out there but you you can't just it's not made wide for the public by the time the Oscars come out not everybody's seen those movies I agree with you Clark they need to make them they need to change something I would like to, when you're talking about Straight Outta Compton, I actually would like to see uh, Jason Mitchell. Is that the actor's name who portrayed Easy E? Yeah, I would like oh, to see him. Great. Yes. I'd like to see him get a nomination. Uh, I would like to see Mad Max Fury Road get a Best Picture nomination. I think more likely you get a George Miller getting a director you directing think? nomination because you have he 10 directed slots. the hell out oh, of it. Oh, he did definitely, but you have ten slots for Best That's Picture. That's true, but they. They, they don't are, always do it. Well, though. the thing is, they expanded that to ten, but then they never like followed through with no, it was, the. Okay, it was only that one year with things. Avatar. Yeah, and that was the year. Speaking of sci-fi, that we had District Nine was up for yes. Best yes, Picture, but that amazing. was. But you're right, Jess. They haven't done that since, since then. then yeah. We haven't seen any genre mm-hmm. stuff. I think we'll probably see hopefully The Martian up in there. Um, what else? Best uh, comedy. Huh? <laughs> for oh, Globe. for the Golden Globe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, best um, comedy. <laughs> Creed. I love Creed. Uh, hopefully Creed gets some. Do you think nom- Sylvester Stallone will get a nomination? I hope so. I think he did a fantastic job. I mean, I still need to watch some more. I mean, The Revenant is a movie I'm really looking forward mm. to. Uh, Hateful Eight is another mm. one. So I still need to watch those to, and then, you know, strip down. Uh, Dope, I really liked as well. Mm. I thought, you know, even though it was an African-American community, I felt like it also, on a broader level, was about like cultural identity, mm-hmm. like and not fitting into what people expect. Because they were of geeks. You. Yeah, they yeah. were geeks, and yeah. they listened to music that wasn't, you know, mainstream right. for, for them. And so uh, that was one of my favorite movies of the mm-hmm. year. I, yeah, I hope that we get different stuff than... I haven't seen Danish Girl, so I can't judge it. But that definitely seems like a more like Oscar Beatty type movie, right? right? It's kind of like The Reader that year. Oh, I, that's the movie that I, one of the movies I always point to, like that. So because people always complain about The Dark Knight not being in that top five that year, and I'm like, you could have easily taken out The Reader. Cause definitely. Well, and that's that. I always think of when Hugh Jackman hosted in his opening song. He get he's singing about all the movies, and he gets to The Reader, and he goes, The Reader. I didn't see the reader (laughs) and it's like it's such a great joke because it's like nobody saw the reader Oscars so yeah Mm -hmm. all right anyway all right guys that's it for mailbag now on to your live tour questions just uh tweet us at collider video and Ashley will pick out a few and we'll answer them right now um first question comes from Kimberly Sutherland and she writes do you guys agree with or have an opinion on Force Awakens 95% on Rotten Tomatoes which is higher than episode four five and six um, I'm sure that's going to come down. Uh, I, th- I think that there's going to be, you know, small backlash to that. And you also have to remember, and this, I always try and say this, about Rotten Tomatoes, the score is not indicative of how 
good the movie is, it's how well liked the movie is. So you can have a movie that has like something like a 95, a 99, or whatever, but that doesn't mean it's a better movie than let's say something that's like an 85. It's, it's just that it's more well liked, it's more mainstream, it has a broad appeal. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of those Pixar movies that get really high Rotten Tomato scores because it's, it's hard to hate on a Pixar movie, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have something that's more controversial that maybe some people don't like. They're like, oh, I don't like that. So I think that that speaks more to its its broad appeal versus, I mean, I, I love the movie, but I, I don't think it's a, a barometer for how great the movie right. is. Right, mm. I think that's fair. And also I was just thinking about, you know, like when Star Wars wasn't an established franchise, like reviewing Empire Strikes Back mm -hmm. as a critic, and especially in a time, by the way, where people were much less forgiving of science fiction films, mm -hmm. and, and they didn't take them as seriously as critics. Um, and so I think that's something to consider in terms of maybe those um, the original three being being having a lower score. But also, I do agree with a 95% positive. I, I, I don't have a lot of negatives about The Force mm -hmm. Awakens. It's a really fun, great mm -hmm. movie, and so I think that that's incredibly accurate. David? Yeah, I agree. It's it's not my favorite movie of the year, no. but like Dennis, you said earlier, it might be the most fun I had at the theater. I have to maybe go see Mad Max again one more time. I've already seen it like three times. I've seen Mad Max one more time, but I had a lot of fun. It's like after I saw the Avengers for the first time, I walked out with just just joy in my heart. I felt joyful. It wasn't the best movie ever made, but I just I felt happy. Like, you see a lot of these indie films that are awesome, but sometimes it just wears you down. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're crying. I just felt so good last night or a few hours ago after coming down to see you. <laughs> I'm losing ago. track of time. I don't even know where I am right now. <laughs> All right, what's next? Angelo Thomas writes, should Disney cancel its Tinkerbell movie with Reese Witherspoon because of Pan's failure at the box office? No, I don't think so. I didn't realize Tinkerbell was such a big thing until I went to my best friend's place and he has, he's got three kids, he's got two daughters, and they were watching those Tinkerbell made for DVD movies over and over. I, I didn't know. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, this is a thing. So no, I, I, I think it's different than, than Pan. I think there's gonna be a big audience for that. Do we know if the Tinkerbell movie is supposed to be live action? Yeah. I think it, it is. is. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Well, no, I don't think they should cancel it. I think it should give it give her a chance to flap her wings and see what happens. Yeah, I wanna see it. I hope I hope Tink is Tink. I wanna I hope she's a little feisty, a little attitude because Tink's always she's She's, you don't mess with Tinker. She'll, she'll, you know, she'll, she'll let you die or something. You know, she's rough. So I hope we get to see that side of Tinkerbell, not some cutesy Tinkerbell. Yeah, and, and studios always have kind of like a knee-jerk reaction to like either movies that hit it really big or fail, and they're like, oh no, our movie is kind of like that, but mm -hmm. they don't really rely on is your movie actually good or not? That's like, um, I was reading that people were really, really worried about Tarzan because Pan tanked so hard. Mm. And then the first trailer came out and I don't know if you guys talked about it on the show yeah. or not, but I actually thought the trailer was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was overall I thought it looked, got positive. Yeah, and so I think to your point, you can't discredit an entire film before it comes out because it's yeah. kind of similar to a thing right. that didn't do so well that one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, you, I do acknowledge there is some sort of association with certain sure. things, even names, you know, like if your title is similar to something else right. or not, you know, it doesn't fit into, you know, this is the movie I was talking about. It's like, you know, Pacific Rim was a movie that had a horrible title and everyone just thought it was like a Transformers kind of ripoff thing. And so I just feel like anything that's kind of associated with something else can affect it. And keep in mind, Pan that tanked uh, was not Disney's Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. It did not focus on Captain Hook. It, kept, it focused on bl Black Bluebeard. Uh, and Hook was there, but he was in a different capacity. Mm -hmm. And so basically the point I'm making is that the Tinkerbell world of Peter Pan that we know is not the same world that was put on screen, mm -hmm. especially as Disney would do it. So. Did, you, did you see Pan? I didn't mm -hmm. see it. No? Let me see it. Wow. Well, that, maybe that explains the low box office. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Mantis Varbu writes, best Joseph Gordon-Levitt movie. Oh. Oh, that's tough. I would have to say Brick off the top of my mm. head. I, I really like Brick. That was Ryan Johnson's, I think, debut mm. feature film. It's like a film noir set in modern times. Kind of almost has a, like a David Mamet-like speech dialogue to it. I need to see it in a while. I haven't seen it in a while, but 
off the top of my head, that's that's the one. I'm gonna go stick, stick with Ryan Johnson, Looper. Okay, uh, I love Looper, especially with uh, him, him and uh, Bruce uh, Will. I'm sorry, Bruce Lee. Yeah, Bruce Lee. That's yeah, an that's awesome a movie. lot of lot of visual effects awesome. for that yeah, one. Uh, no, him and Bruce Willis, their chemistry was fantastic. You know, I like when Joseph Gordon-Levitt does comedy. Um, I think he's really funny and light on his feet and uh, and entertaining. And I loved The Night Before. Mm -hmm. um, so did I. People didn't see it, and I think that's a shame. So if you can go see it, go see it. And mm -hmm. um, he's great in 50-50. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, this one where he had the, the cancer? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 With Seth Rogen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, see, and I think it's the same director as Night yeah, Before, John, too. Jonathan yeah, Jonathan Levine. So, um, and I'm not a, I'm not a big rom-com person, so I didn't really love 500 Days of Summer. But I loved the musical number in it. <laughs> So. With Han Solo, like, <laughs> <hey>. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's do one more. All right, Christopher Woodburn writes best acting performance ever in a film. For me, it's Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. Thanks. Oh, ever, 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 ever. 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 That's, ever. That's, that's tough. <laughs> that's hard. Man. Oh my god. That, yeah, that's a. I mean, can I go acting duo? Do you want another question? No, no, no. We'll <laughs> answer it, but I, I, I won't say okay. This is definitive, but I always just kind of go back to like someone like a Daniel Day Lewis, you know, like sure, like there will be blood, or even even the though the movie itself I thought was good but not great. Like Lincoln, mm -hmm. he was phenomenal in it. He's great in My Left Foot. Yeah, um, that's an incredible performance. But but I'm sure there's a lot more that I can point to. I just can't think off the top of my head. Uh, what about you guys? I, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna go same movie duo, Godfather two, Pacino, oh, yeah. and um, uh, Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro, father okay. and son, Flash, just it's fantastic. Those guys together, that's that's one of my greatest films of all time. Godfather two, De Niro, and uh, Pacino. God, I don't think I can even come up with an answer for this. Can you name like a few things that stick like out? Like incredible to you? performances. I mean, I. Uh, one that just jumped to my mind is Roy Scheider in Jaws, actually. Oh. I think that is a beautiful, nuanced, quiet performance. Um, I like people who play multi-layers, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, Daniel Day-Lewis is is an incredible actor, yeah. and those scenes, you know, with um, in Godfather 2 are, mm -hmm. are incredible, and Al Pacino is, I love him, and like, um, I was just thinking about uh, You Don't Know Jack, mm -hmm. the movie about Kevorkian oh, that he no. did for HBO. That was one of, I mean, I thought he he was incredible. Um, Chris, I just rewatched Seven Psychopaths mm. and Christopher Walken, like we know him as this goofy grandpa, you know, yeah. now, but I felt like he showed up for that movie in a way that he hadn't showed up in a long time. Um, also, say one more, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, um, please. Uh, Christoph Waltz in, uh, uh, in Glorious Bastards. He was that. such a good villain and so iconic in that role that I feel like now, even like when you watch like Spectre, he's just kind of doing that same role <laughs> over and over. It's because he was so good. I'll tell you one of my favorite performances ever is Charlie Chaplin in The Great Dictator. Uh -oh. mm. That is one of the most heartbreaking, beautiful, sincere, gorgeous performances that I can think of. I mean, I, that's one of my favorite movies of all time, too. But um, there's a lot of just, I like when people, they show their heart, even if it's a mean heart, yeah. even if it's a bad heart. De Niro for Raging Bull and Taxi Driver. Those two, yeah. he he killed it with those. I'm trying to think of who else. I mean, and Meryl More Streep is obviously known as Meryl Streep yes. for for obvious reasons. Well, she and kills it even in a movie like Devil Wears Prada. But Devil Wears Prada is mm. not a bad movie. No, I, I'm, not saying it's, I'm not saying <laughs> yeah. it's a bad movie. I enjoyed the movie. But what I'm saying is she brings it even in something that's like, you know, rom com standard fare. She's a truly incredible actress. And um, I'm trying to uh, think of uh, Malcolm McDowell in Clockwork Orange. Mm -hmm. yeah, as a young man, he was fancy. He was great in that. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Marlon Brando as course, well yeah. on the waterfront, Apocalypse Now. Betty what Davis else? has given some incredible historical performances. I know I'm going old school, but mm -hmm. she's she I, I love her in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which is so such a twisted, weird, goofy movie, but I love it. You know, it doesn't get a lot of credit as to think. Um, uh, well, he gets credit. I shouldn't say that. Uh, Bogart. Yeah. Because he kind of plays the same guy. He always is like the same talk, same kind of guy, but he just he does it. So it looks effortless. The one he's on screen, like he's not even trying. He's just up there just doing his thing. And Bogart, like especially I just watched Casablanca recently. He's fantastic and everything. I got one. Um, l this is going to sound silly. You guys are going to laugh because you're going to laugh. But um, Liza Minnelli in Cabaret. Mm -hmm. um, Cabaret is an incredible movie. Mm -hmm. And it beat 
the Godfather for Best Picture at the Oscars, and there's a reason. Mm. I'm not saying it's a better film, but I am saying that it is it is up there with the Godfather. And I know we know Liza Minnelli again is the, the crazy grandma yeah. now, but um, you know it is a, it's a musical that's not a musical where people break into song. Mm -hmm. it takes place at a nightclub, therefore the songs are all organic. Um, it's a drama about Nazi Germany, and um, and Liza Minnelli, you know, I think in that film, and then her debut was the Sterile Cuckoo. In those two films, she proves that she is a legend, not because her parents were mm -hmm. Hollywood legends, but because she is an incredible actress. Another one is Dudley Moore and Arthur. Oh. That's a great uh, one of my favorite it. films, uh, Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia. Mm. So, no. All right, uh, guys, that's it for today's show. I want to thank the people joining me at the table. Clark, where can people find you? Thank you for having me, Dennis. You guys can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, Periscope <laughs> at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and on youtube.com slash official Clark Wolf. I think I'm going to do a little uh, Force Awakens spoilery review as soon mm. as I get home. Nice. So you can come onto YouTube for that. Mm. David? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at GriffinDE and uh, like uh, my lovely co host right here, Clark Wolf. We're on some after shows. Yes. yes. Clark's on Supergirl. I'm doing uh, Rebels and Flash. So the recap shows, we got a little break. Yeah. We'll be back in January, but you can find me there. And Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, at Ashley Mova. It's the weekend. Happy Friday, guys. <laughs> and you guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And just want to remind you to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Collider Videos. And also, our, our Star Wars The Force Awakens non-spoiler review is up right now. The spoiler one is going to be up in a few hours. So check those out. And we'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.